Greetings class, welcome to another lesson here in uh, TESOL methods, uh, specifically for math and science, content-based uh, type of uh, methods for teaching uh, English to speakers of other languages. My name is Dr. Frank Tuzzi. Today we're going to be looking at Kala, a little bit of an overview of what it is, some of the related historical and theoretical frameworks, and then how it relates to other theories as well. So let's get started right away, take a look at what Kala is. Kala actually stands for Cognitive academic language learning and it's an approach used and developed out of research which is one of the reasons why I like this I actually prefer this over uh, other types of theories um, it is an instructional model that attempts to meet the needs of the English language learners and not only does it try to meet their needs but it tries to meet their needs in the environment that they're in which is in the academy in in public schools or in the school system or in colleges and so we're try the model here seeks to try to meet those needs in the environment that they're in. It's a little different from others, and it really is still um, a flavor of content-based instruction, but they give more of a scientific uh, foundation for having it. It focuses not only on what the students are learning, but it focuses on the curriculum. It focuses on um, the instruction, how on what the instructions are, and it focuses on teacher expertise. Um, so it actually is looking at more than just this, this theoretical model, but how does it impact what's being taught and the uh, experiences and expertise of teachers. Uh, about a dozen years ago, actually even more than that, about 25 years ago, there were articles and even books on the need for native, I'm sorry, the need for uh, mainstream teachers in the public school systems to know how to handle and deal with the needs of second language learners. Um, and uh, this approach seeks to try to do that, uh, try to meet those needs. That again, is 20, that 25 year old uh, articles and books tries to meet those needs by using the content that uh, students have in their classes. So it's very good that it's that way. It does include all teachers. This is for TESOL teachers like me and also primary teachers. The main teachers in the elementary and or junior high, senior high classes, high school, uh, college classes as well. So it seeks to try to educate and train and provide for those teachers as well. Uh, it also includes all different types of timelines, uh, time frames. So you have some students who are in an IEP program. They're in an intensive English program. This type of uh, approach you can use there. You can use them in... Um, immersion type programs or the high intensity language uh, training programs. You can also use them in transitional or bridge programs uh, where students are partially in a program and partially in the mainstream and then of course you have mainstream. This approach can work with with uh, any timeline again which is a nice thing it's going to be more versatile that way. Some uh, background on Kala or the Cognitive Academic Language Learning Approach. Uh, some background on this. It's based on research. One of the reasons why I like this approach because it is actually based on the research of language, uh, language learning and linguistics, how the brain works and that kind of thing. And so it's, it's, it's less based on the educational side of uh, teachers saying, gee, how can we help improve this students? I mean, it, it does have that, but it's also based on the research of how learning is done. Uh, and so that's one reason why I like it better. It's also based on more than 30 years of language learning strategies research. What language learning strategies are going to help students best learn in the environment that they're in? And they have a dual need, if you've noticed here. They've got two needs here. They've got the need to learn language, and they have to, the need to learn academic content. Now, uh, when you're teaching overseas, like I was, the primary uh, content that you, you taught your students was language, because uh, that's what they were trying to learn. This approach, which I believe is actually much better, not only focuses on language, but focuses on the content that they need to study. Now, I had the opportunity while I was teaching overseas I, to teach at a science university, and the content I was given was science content. Students, it was an English class, but it was science content. So it was very much like this dual process, this dual need that students had. They had the academic language needs. They needed the BICs, and BICs, again, was your basic interpersonal communication skills. And they needed the CALP, right, your cognitive academic language proficiency. 
the specific language and vocabulary used in the academy, used in a particular science class, or, or regardless of whatever class that it was in, there was that particular uh, element. And then there was the actual academic content. If you were teaching mathematics or geography or world history or... Uh, oh, chemistry, whatever, the content also needs to be taught. And so the teacher who uses this color approach is going to have to have some information in, in both of these areas. The academic language area, which is what we're focusing on as, uh, as TESOL educators, and then there's also the content, which means we're going to need to do extra work and or get extra help uh, so that we can understand the content. Okay. This academic content also comes from uh, Mohan's Integrated Language and Content Model, which was an older model that had as its base the concept of teaching uh, content inside a language class so that the, the, the uh, students can be better prepared, pretty much what Kala is hoping to try to do as well. That was later subsumed into content-based instruction, uh, which is, again, older than Kala, and then eventually put into Kala and SIAP. Well, in this course, obviously, we're going to be studying, or this section, we're going to be studying uh, more of Kala. Other uh, elements inside uh, the, the uh, background of Kala is cognitive learning theory. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, but it's really talking about how the brain processes information, how the brain stores and then uses and retrieves information. Um, again, something... I find more attractive as a language teacher because I realize the language starts here. I'm not merely an educator. I'm, mere, I'm an educator who's dealing with language acquisition and language use. Uh, and so I appreciate this whole uh, cognitive learning theory. Obviously, it comes out of uh, psychology and neuro, uh, neurolinguistics, uh, but it's, very, it's a fascinating field. The final influence of um, Kella is uh, us teachers. Uh, we who have experience and understanding uh, teaching in an environment, um, in the variety of environments that are there, we can also bring our expertise, our uh, knowledge base to this learning process. And Kala actually uses that information as well to help mold and model um, the Kala approach. Okay, so these areas, again, um, based on research, based on... Um, learning strategies research based on the dual needs that student need based on cognitive learning and based on um, teacher expertise teacher experiences let's take a look at uh, the overview or an overview of what Kala is all about it combines language learning and content learning again so there's your dual approach again it was originally designed for upper level students and, but now they use it everywhere. It works well with all systems. It's informed by the cognitive uh, learning theories, which we talked a little bit about before. It's also informed by sociocultural or the constructivist learning theories uh, that you may have studied in, in uh, other areas. And so it's trying to do not only the internal uh, learning um, components, but also the sociocultural learning components, uh, kind of like what Vygotsky would be saying as far as ha having... Uh, some scaffolding or what uh, uh, other uh, researchers talking about having the other there. We need that other person. So Cullet uses both. It's more of a triangulated approach uh, to language learning and triangulation is definitely something I appreciate um, as a language researcher. Kala has basically composed of three basic parts. Uh, the first part is the content, content that's being taught or whatever that may be. Again, that depends on your level or your expertise or you know whatever your students have uh, need for. The second is academic language proficiency, and that's learning language, but it's also learning language in the academy, in the public schools or in the college or wherever your students are. So that's going to include um, your, your basic four... Uh, skills, your two databases, um, your your BICs and your CALP, uh, all rolled into one there in that academic language development. And the third one is uh, learning strategies. Learning strategies is a big part here, how to develop independent learners, how to develop learners who are good language learners because they understand what their strategies and their styles are. Um, and that's, that's that whole element of the uh, learning strategies. Three parts again, content, uh, academic language development and then learning strategies and that's a basic overview we'll look at another another way of looking at uh, what Kala is later on but that's your basic overview according to uh, according to uh, Shema and their text 
Let's take a look at the conceptual framework uh, of Kala. Um, actually, if you look at any conceptual framework that's trying to deal with a theory of uh, language learning, it should include these three areas. It should be founded on scientific research, which I hope you've already seen a little bit of that uh, just in the brief overview. And it should explain what's learned, what are students learning, and it should explain how students learn it. So you get a dual process that's going, or a double process that's going on there. What do they need to learn, and then how do they need to learn that? And then it should also provide some scaffolding. Um, it should provide some scaffolding for the students as they learn the process, as they build themselves to become independent learners in a particular area. Uh, now, as I said before, the scientific uh, element uh, of uh, color is based on cognitive theories and also sociocultural theories. And the cognitive theories uh, help teachers understand how students process the information in their head, what's going on in their, in their mind as they're trying to grapple with information, as they're trying to store information, as they're trying to use the information that they have. Um, so some of these conceptual theories uh, try to show teachers, uh, you know, the mental processes that are going on and try to show teachers how they can uh, encourage students to take information and put it into longer storage uh, uh, areas in their brain. Learning is a mental activity. It makes a lot of sense. It's also an individual activity, and it's affected by the social context. So when I learn, I'm learning. I am the one who has to learn, but I also need to learn. So I've got processes going on in my head. That's one thing. But I also need to learn based on the, the, my surroundings, based on the people I interact with, based on the cultural norms. Okay, so again, that's that dual process that's going on. It's mental. It's a mental activity, but it, it includes both mental processes and then sociocultural processes. Cognitive theory explores how learners process, store, and retrieve information, and how they acquire new skills. Okay, so cognitive theory is goes right in line with language learning. Because it's exploring how learners process information, how they store it, how they process the grammar elements, the the uh, syntactic elements, the lexical elements, how they process uh, sound, how they process um, multiple meanings uh, in words, how they process the cultural explanations of it, the nonverbal things. And so uh, it fits right in line with language learning, cognitive theory. It also tries to... Uh, explore how users save information, how they save ideas, words, memories, and how they save processes, um, and how they are used. I think I mentioned at one point, I, I learned this word, uh, to carry the load, a uh, Japanese word. And I knew the word, and I told, I'm going to carry this load uh, somehow, and I wanted to use it in a language. Well, I could store the information. It was like a, a dictionary definition. Okay, what what uh, cognitive theorists would call declarative information. It's a fact. It's a it's a concept, right? And I knew what it was, but I didn't know how to use it. Okay, I didn't understand the process of actually using this word. And I waited. I don't know how many weeks or months after I had learned and memorized the word, after I had taken it out of my working memory and stuck it into longer term memory. I I had it. And at one point, I'm in a meeting, and I hear someone use the word properly. You know, that's some, that's some of the load that we're going to have to carry. You know, and I hear this person say that, and I immediately go, ah, that's how you use that information. It was exciting for me to be able to take declarative information and put it into process some way that I could actually use it. Okay? Now, cognitive language theorists basically say that declarative information okay, or facts-based information, definitions type of things, concepts, is one type of information. And then there's another type of information called process information. And that's how the brain pro uh, stores in, uh, ideas or things that are actually a process that we actually walk through, actually go through, right? I can memorize things like the parts of a bicycle, you know, I can memorize the wheel or the frame or the pedals or the brakes or the I can remember but to actually learn how to ride a bike that's a whole different thing that's more than just the facts it includes the process it's more than just knowing information it includes movements in my body 
just like language as well. It in, involves movement. It involves creating a stream of sounds that make sense to other people. And so we've got two different sets of, uh, of information here. We've got declarative information and we have uh, procedural information. Okay? And they're stored in the brain differently. Uh, so you as a language teacher need to understand, need to try to uh, recognize how much exposure does one need in order to store these types of uh, information and what type of interactions do you need in order for them to actually use them properly. Okay? There are other, um, there are other uh, word, cognitive uh, language words uh, that we talk about when we talk about memory. We talk about things like short-term memory. And that's something that's in your head for just a little while, and then it's gone. It's it's in a it's in a temporary memory location type of thing. And then we have longer term memory things that we, after we've used them a certain number of times, we take them out of short term when we put them into long term. We also have something called um, working memory, um, and that's where uh, the the memory that we have, whether it's long term or short term, but we have it in a place, and we can do stuff with it. We can manipulate it. We can uh, alter it or, or modify it, as it were. The, this working memory I would uh, look at as some kind of RAM, uh, computer memory, because computer RAM memory is basically electronic memory. And I can put stuff there, and I can move stuff around in that memory, but the minute I turn the electricity off, that memory is gone. Okay, before I do anything, before I shut off the electricity, I need to take that working memory stuff and try to store it somewhere. Okay, but I can mess around with that. Short-term memory, I really can't mess around with a whole bunch of things uh, with it, okay, other than ho hold it in that memory slot and hopefully retrieve it. Working memory is stuff that I can actually work with. It's more like RAM. And uh, long-term memory is more like a hard drive where you can store that information and retrieve it later. Um, but enough of technology. <laughs> um, both sets of information, your declarative information and your process information, are typically uh, used in language activities. So as you're reading a book or as you're talking with somebody, you've got both of these things that are going on. If you're trying to do something, whether you're baking a cake or you're uh, writing a, a song, you're dealing with both sets of these. You're dealing with both the process and you're dealing with um, the declarative or the, inf the static information. And so again, language teaching, this conceptual framework, color rep recognizes that we've got these dual, dual uh, sets of uh, memory uh, information patterns in the brain, both stored differently but both retrieved to do certain functions. Okay, <clears throat> um, those are your related, the, the conceptual framework that kind of holds up Kala. Um, but Kala also tries to incorporate or recognize the benefits from other theories. And here's just a few of them uh, that are related. Uh, one of them is literacy across the curriculum. Now, if you know anything about uh, teachings in high schools or in colleges, there are programs uh, in place in many of these where they try to encourage teachers to teach writing in every class. It doesn't matter if you're a philosophy teacher or whether you're a uh, business administration teacher, uh, whether you're dealing in finance, uh, whether you're dealing in uh, y you know chemical engineering, r regardless, they want to try to encourage you to be also be a writing teacher so that we can create better writers. And you have this literacy across the curriculum. Well, kind of, that's what Kala is. Kala basically takes the curriculum and tries to incorporate it into the language class, and they appreciate the inverse. They appreciate that there are lang there are teachers who recognize their students need. Uh, some extra support in language development and in their science class they spend a little extra time trying to describe vocabulary or trying to describe procedures uh, so that their students can understand. They're trying to do this language teaching across the curriculum. Nice idea. The language experience approach. This is actually relatively new to me although it's not really a new uh, concept. Uh, most of the people that I have taught already uh, had a first language that uh, they could read and write and most of the people I have been teaching as uh, in second language are high school college age um, but this approach is useful for students who don't have a lot of first language background who don't have a lot of writing background um, 
And so we can use their own experience and we get their experience and we can literally write their experience down, whether they understand the concepts of words written on paper or not. Uh, you can then teach them their language. And you, you can you, – basically what you're doing is you're writing down what they're saying exactly the way they say it, whether it's appropriate or not. Whether it's correct or not, you write it down exactly as the way they sang it. And you teach them how to read that, and then you can teach them to modify that. It's an excellent way to take old information, prior knowledge, knowledge that the student already has, and use it to learn language. Okay? Uh, I've never really used it before, but I like the idea. If I were working with younger students, um, I, I would try to get them to tell a story or to explain whatever and then write it down exactly that way. An excellent idea. Again, Kala is trying to use that with the background knowledge and the pre-knowledge and to try to help them bridge that gap. Okay. The balanced reading approach, um, and that's where you've got people who have different learning styles, some who can see the big picture. They can see the forest through the trees, and then you've got other people who can't see the forest. They can only see the trees. In other words, there are some that process uh, from um, specific to general, and there are those that process from general to specific, uh, inductive and deductive types of uh, uh, reasoning or processing. And the balanced reading approach says, well, as you're teaching reading, do a little bit of both. Do a little bit of a discrete analysis of the components of reading, but also just do general reading. Reading for fun, reading to get uh, you know to get the main idea, and so you have both sides. And uh, as I was learning about this, I thought to myself, oh, it's the eclectic approach, which is the approach that I would call um, what I have. It's an eclectic way of learning because people learn differently. So you, as a teacher, you want to have a variety of ways of doing this. This balanced reading approach fits perfectly in with that, and also fits in with Kala, who recognizes there are different learning styles and different learning strategies, and we as teachers need to try to identify what they are help students recognize their own strengths and weaknesses and then also strengthen their weaknesses. Process writing. Uh, we've uh, spoken about, uh, no, we have it not in, this, in, not in these segments, but process writing is where you look at writing as a process, not a product. To be honest, writing is both a process and it is a product. But for many students growing up, they have learned that language is only a product, and they don't know, they don't understand what this process is. And so writing should be a process. And again, that fits well in with uh, the color idea of developing language and developing uh, independent language learners as they go through the process of learning about uh, strategies and, of course, the, the uh, databases and, um, and the skills. Uh, cooperative learning. This uh, fits in with um, constructivist style learning, where we learn from one another. We construct ideas and, and understandings. Um, and uh, Kella will also want to encourage that because there are students that are then going into these other classrooms and they need to participate in discussion, in project development, um, and possibly in writing as well. So cooperative learning. Inquiry-based learning. Um, is basically some type of scientific or uh, discovery style learning where you're asking a question and trying to find uh, a solution to that question. Um, oftentimes I've read about inquiry-based learning where the teacher actually doesn't know the answer to the question, which is good. Uh, and so they're asking a question they don't know the answer to, and the student's job is to go out and find that answer. You teach them the process of inquiry-based education uh, and how they can do research and collect data and analyze and assess and summarize, um, and that's inquiry-based learning. Again, Kala is going to fit in nicely with that when you're trying to develop independent learners. Lastly, standards-based uh, instruction, um, and that's instruction that's based off of the standards of the specialists. Um, in recent years, uh, and if you continue uh, reviewing uh, Shama's book, The Kala Handbook, which is where I'm getting a lot of my information, um, if you look at this uh, text, uh, uh, Shama basically goes through um, a variety of areas where uh, specialists in mathematics or science or geography, uh, history, have decided what the requirements are, and they've developed a standard. Uh, and then we can now use that standard uh, in developing uh, curriculum. And so as we're uh, working with Kala, we're also wanting to know, well, what is it that we're needing to teach? We can find out what we're wanting to teach by looking at the, the standards that the professionals from other areas have created. And these are just some of the related uh, concepts, uh, instructional concepts that Kala um, appreciates and also takes advantage of in some form or another. 
this is a color model. Uh, this was taken offline. Um, you can see that it's adapted uh, from um, uh, Shema, who's his Barnhart, Dinery, and Robbins. Uh, and basically, it's the two-step process for the Kala model. The teacher's responsibility is that they're supposed to be preparing and then presenting, practicing, and then giving a self-evaluation, and then trying to do some expansion. That's the teacher's responsibility. We looked at that in other <clears throat> lessons here. The student's responsibility is the other <clears throat> side of this, uh, uh, what is this, quadra, quadrilateral. <clears throat> Students need to attend, participate. They need to... Uh, apply the strategies they've learned, they need to use strategies to become more independent, and they need to transfer tasks, transfer strategies to new tasks. Um, so this is kind of like the model that uh, fits together. We as teachers, we're obviously doing this part of the model, and so we need to do our part, and we also need to encourage students to do, to do their part. And that's all for the overview about what Kala is. If you do have any questions, please let me know, and I'll talk to you later.